All right, welcome everybody. We are, uh, this is the last week of talking at 12, by the way. So we've got this one on Tuesday and on Thursday, we're gonna be uh, meeting with a couple of our students to talk about some of our music organizations. So thanks to welcome. everyone who has stuck through and watched them all and made this their annual you know, viewing party. Uh, we appreciate all of you. Uh, today, I am joined by Jim Pisano, uh, Director of Jazz Ensembles, Lucas Hewlett, Director of Athletic Bands, and uh, Dr. Timothy Shade, Director of Bands. Um, and you've met them all before in different sessions, but uh, today it's, we're gonna be speaking to a very special group of uh, people in our building, in our campus, which is the non-music major. And, um, and sort of, if if you don't want to be a music major, is there a place for you on our campus? Spoiler alert, yes, there is, uh, absolutely. So uh, Lucas, I wanted to actually start with you as sort of the, the probably the ensemble that has the largest participation of non-music majors per capita quota, I don't know, uh, percentage wise. Um, so Shocker Sound, Shocker Sound uh, Machine, um, talk a little bit about the non-major role in those groups and um, what that looks like. Right. So uh, my non-major community was well over half of my ensemble this year. Um, and what I enjoy the most about bringing this to a non-major community is that so many of them feel that they don't have access to music when uh, they reach college. Uh, a lot of them give it up. Um, a lot of them find it uh, intimidating. And so uh, it's really a place that I like to involve everyone. We've, we've practiced things at various levels. Um, we give everyone ample time to learn music. Um, yeah, I think that... Uh... So just a follow up. So as a non-music major, what's my time commitment look like to Shocker Sound, Shocker Sound Machine? Like I know if I'm at K-State, or another plan that's got a big a big marching band, for instance. It's like every game on the weekends. You know, so what, is the, what does that participation look like and time commitment look like on our place? So right now we rehearse twice a week, uh, Monday and Thursday evenings. Um, and come mid to late October, the basketball season will start. We play a couple of games leading up to that point, mostly for volleyball. Um, but over the course of an entire season, uh, our app, uh, pep band can be expected to play something like 50 games in an entire season um and then with our with a shocker sound machine our marching we go out probably six or seven times during the fall semester uh to do group recruiting and then we will perform at least three or four times in the fall um and probably two or three more times in the spring as well um as a marching ensemble or as a pep ensemble and so the time varies. Uh, I try to break up uh, Shocker Sound into various teams because of how many games uh, generally occur, particularly over break. Uh, last year, there were something like 15 games between Christmas and the top of the semester. And so our kids were completely shredded <laughs> during that point. And so the, the idea of having teams keeps everyone somewhat sane while giving everyone an opportunity to still participate in all facets of what we do. Yeah, thanks. So Jim, jazz program. Let's talk about being a non-major in the jazz program. Uh, oh, we, go ahead. We would love love to have you. Um, we have, it's, it's a really neat opportunity. We have two jazz, large jazz ensembles like our tra your traditional big band uh, format. And particularly in the second jazz ensemble, it's a wonderful mix of music majors and non-majors. Um, and it's a great opportunity for the non-majors um, to gain experience and for the music majors to actually provide a mentoring role to, to those non-majors. Uh, one big thing I wanna say is there is no improvisation required. I think the biggest thing that um, uh, students can get concerned about about playing in the jazz ensemble is do I have to improvise and the answer is no you don't we are constantly looking for very strong section players and um, you can certainly go the entire time playing in the jazz ensemble here at WSU without improvising now if you'd like to and you haven't before 
definitely um, there are resources available to you. We will help you and coach you if you would love to play solo. Uh, we would love to help you. So um, we also have a Latin jazz ensemble called Banda Hispanica. And that is more um, stylistically in the realm of salsa music. Um, there are some vocalists that sing with the group as well. And um, they rehearse once a week. Jazz Arts 2 rehearses twice a week, and Jazz Arts 1 rehearses three times a week. So it's not um, a, a very, very grueling rehearsal schedule. Um, and I, one thing I'd like to point out, or another thing I'd like to point out, is that it affords, because of all these ensembles, it affords the opportunity, uh, I'm thinking of a couple non-majors right now, that play in a jazz ensemble, play in symphonic band, and play in Chakra Sound. And so the way we have the rehearsals scheduled out during the week and they don't conflict and, you know, our concert blocks are, like I said, aren't grueling. We do on, on all those jazz ensembles that I just mentioned, we do two concerts per semester. So, um, and, and um, it, like I said, it, there are non-majors that participate in all three groups. Great. Um, Tim, I'm gonna actually ask you to not wear your band director hat, but to wear the scholarship hat and the audition day hat uh, and so it's a pretty common question that we get from non-majors is, do I have to audition um, and are there scholarships available to non-majors? So why don't you field both of those questions? So if you get online and you look at a lot of our uh, music website stuff, it'll talk a lot about auditions and what we're, who we're really talking to are the music majors at that point that are auditioning for scholarships to become a music major. So for all of the ensembles, I can't think if there's any really that's not. There is an audition, but it's really a seating placement. And that audition occurs in the fall, usually the Friday before classes start. And then the Monday of the first week of classes is where we have those auditions. Those are not for scholarships. And unfortunately, right now, we don't formally offer non-majors scholarships. Uh, once students arrive that are non-majors, there is a possibility that they could get some financial support. Uh, we have lots of different ways. Sometimes donors come forward uh, and say, here's a pool of money to give to non-majors. Please disperse it as you will. Um, I know the bands have had that, a choir has had it recently. So, but unfortunately, formally, we don't offer any financial assistance right now for non-music majors. So that audition stuff is all for the fall. Most of the information you're seeing about audition information on the website, like I said, is for our music majors. It's a less or a, uh, an easier process for the ensemble placements in the fall. Most of us, like I know that I do, I'm pretty sure Professor Pisano and Professor Hewlett will put up information uh, that Jesse Coza, our assistant, will put up that has specific excerpts or telling you exactly what you need to do to audition for each ensemble. It's really, it seems intimidating. Most students go, I can't play at the college level. I'm not a music major. I can't do this. This, I can't, I can't do this. Well, actually you've been playing your instrument or singing for about eight years. Maybe some of you seven, maybe some of you six, you're going to be fine. So it's, don't, don't take it so, uh, don't be so afraid. We have a seat for any person that auditions. In my four years, this will be my fifth year. I've never turned a student away from participating in the bands. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't speak for P Professor Pisano or the choirs, but I'm pretty sure it's the same. We're not turning students away at this point. So please get rid of that misnomer that, uh, that we, you have to be of a certain level to participate. That's not true. Well, and the thing to remember about that that's really important is you, you have been, probably been playing your instrument as long as our music majors have. Yeah. You maybe didn't practice as much as them and maybe your passion isn't as strong as yeah. a music major, but you've probably had about the same amount of time on that instrument. Um, so you're certainly qualified. And I think that's really important is that sometimes people think that a school of music at a university is like a medical school and you only can be a part of it if you're like good enough to be a doctor. But the reality is, we, you know, we've got places for you. Um, I also wanted to just personally address this sort of in between, there is an in between the music major and the non-major, and that's the music minor, um, which we have quite a few students who participate in that. Also, not a formal audition as far as our regular audition days go to be a music minor. You just declare it as a minor and show up. But that's a way that if you want to um, 
if you know the way that I, I look at it sort of like on three tiers the music major is the person who is dedicated to music as their um, vocation when they leave when they graduate they want to be involved within the field of music the non-major is the person who likes making music but is really interested in uh, more at the hobby kind of level and then I think of the music minor as like this in between that they don't necessarily want to have a vocation in music as their career, but they still remember like they have a they they want to care about a little deeper than just a hobby. They want to have um, maybe they want to continue on when they graduate playing in like community bands or um, singing a, a community choir and want a few a little more of a deeper dive into music than just being in ensembles. Um, so I think those, those three fields, and I will also just say, if you're thinking about being a music minor, double major, uh, double major, and then you can figure out if, because by the first, the first two years of the minor and the first two years of the major are almost identical. So after your first two years, if you decide you don't want to be a double major anymore, you can drop it and you'll have basically what you need to be a minor. So uh, a lot of, a lot of students that I'll talk to also that are on the fence, really want to be heavily involved in music, but maybe they're interested in biology or engineering. The Bachelor of Arts degree is an interesting concept, and I'm not trying to recruit more music majors at this point because that's what this video is for, but it's definitely worth checking out. And, and do we all, I forget, do we scholarship Bachelor of Arts students? We do, right? Yes. We do. Yeah, uh, not, yeah I mean, uh, anyone who majors in music is eligible for a scholarship. Mm -hmm. So if you're majoring as a Bachelor of Arts, and that degree is interesting because it has a large secondary concentration. I, I want to say it's something like 24 credits are for the secondary concentration outside of music. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a, that's a nice hybrid degree. Um, so Jim, I want to come back to you uh, to talk a little bit more about, you know, so as a non-major, I can participate in these different big bands and jazz bands. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked a little, and this actually be a good question for all of us is a little bit sort of what's the, what am I expected to practice though? I'm, I'm not major. So do I need to practice like the majors do or what does that look like? Yeah, the, uh, there is going to be some outside work that you're going to have to do to, to learn the parts, but it's very, very minimal. And um, what one thing that we implement, um, you know, in rehearsal sectionals. So that helps a lot. Um, about two or three weeks in to a concert uh, schedule, rehearsal block, as we, we tend to call it, um, we'll divide into sections and the section leaders will sort of run that and um, encompass some of the issues that come up uh, on your instrument and with the music. So generally with that and a little bit of outside practice, we're talking like if you take 15, 20 minutes uh, a week, uh, a couple of times a week and, and rehearse and practice your music, you'll be just fine. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, that it's interesting, most of us take care of, of learning the repertoire in rehearsal. Now, as opposed to high school, we're learning repertoire much faster. So uh, where you might spend literally, you know, two months on three tunes, you'll spend six to seven weeks on five or six tunes. So what I tell a lot of my students is the same thing. If you can get the rehearsal ahead or just a little bit ahead and practice for five or 10 minutes, you'd be surprised how much better rehearsal will be for you. So it's not a significant time commitment outside of rehearsal. I know for the bands, it's the same thing. We'll do in, in rehearsal sectionals. I do ask the students to do maybe one or two outside, but that's an extra hour commitment that you all set up yourself once a rehearsal block. Other than that, it's just the concerts that are outside of the rehearsal time for, for the bands. And I, I think a lot of us are kind of working that way. So really the time commitment is not extensive, but there's gonna be some things you're gonna to wanna to look at. We wanna make sure that you're challenged with the repertoire that we're playing. So yeah, it's that maintenance thing more than anything else. Yeah, I, I also agree. I find that those students that decide to put forth any sort of practice effort, especially in athletic bands, one thing that those guys do have to look forward to is that we do re-audition in the spring for tournament band. And so those that do work towards preparing that book and, and preparing for travel and working with a large group do get that incentive kind of at, at the end of our season to, to work towards. And so that ends up being a great driver for us. Um, I, 
I will say that any time spent outside of rehearsal is is a huge plus. Um, but for us especially, we do spend a lot of time working as a group. And so it's a lot about building that group dynamic as a whole, particularly for us. Yeah. And I think, you know, the way you have to remember this as a non-major is that um, at the end of the day, while this is a, an activity that you're doing for um, some personal growth, it is also a class that you're registering for. So just like every other class, you got homework, you know, and your homework is going to be, you know, 15, 20 minutes of just brushing up on the rep uh, and making sure you're feeling, you know, um, aligned with it. So, uh, and another, another fun thing about playing in an ensemble at a university level is all the students want to be there. And yeah. I'm not, not pushing against anything at the high school level, but all of the students have chosen to take that class for credit. And so the level is just turned up significantly, not necessarily in your requirement, but I think most students find that they have a heck of a lot more fun because, wow, Johnny and Susie really love this. Like I do, this is really great, you know, versus there's some students in, in high school, especially just it's, it's there for fun, but they know they're not going to continue by their third or fourth year. They just don't, don't put as much effort as other people. And I should mention, um, while not on this call, we also have Dr. Le Mark Laycock, who's our director of orchestras, uh, another totally open and inviting place for non-majors. So you non-major string players um, and even some wind players, like you can play in our orchestra and play some really great music. And Dr. Ryan Beacon, and Dr. Juan, our choral directors, um, you know, if you go back and watch one of our previous episodes about the choral program, we talk a lot about non-major participation in that video, but yeah, absolutely, we've got a lot of interaction there. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out that I think is really important to note too is that um, not every degree, but a lot of degrees in our, on our campus have a certain amount of electives available. So when you're registering for these classes, for these ensembles, they will count towards your degree progress. So it's kind of funny, like you might be, let's say you're a, um, a sociology major and you might go, well, I, I, only ha I can only take courses that are either general education or sociology courses, but you have, I think it's over 20 credits of electives. Well, guess what? These ensembles, any music ensemble counts as an elective towards your degree. So um, you can actually make some progress towards your degree while taking these classes. So you don't have to just do this out of your own, um, just because you want to, it can actually be productive towards your degree path. Um, so I want to point that out. Also, the other thing about our ensembles is they're one credit. So all of our ensembles are, are one credit across the board. Um, so it's not a huge uh, credit or financial commitment um, as well. And something that I'd like to expound upon that Professor Pisano said is, is you can be involved in just about as much or as little as you want to be involved with. There's no requirement uh, to take lessons and be involved in a studio to play in the big bands, you know, but at the same time, we do have private lessons for every instrument that are available for non-majors. If you want to play in a big band in the orchestra, that's a possibility. If you want to sing in a choir and play in the athletic bands, that's a possibility. So it's really up to each individual student how much they want to engage. We try and leave that as open as possible so that way that the student can decide uh, their level of participation. And I think that's important. Yeah, so Dr. Shade, you brought up um, a great point, which is that not only do we have ensembles you can participate as a non-major, but we also have lessons and they're specifically designed as a non-major lesson. So, so Jim, as, as our, not only our director of jazz ensembles, but an applied, well, our only implied, applied instructor in the, in the group, can you talk a little bit about what a lesson for a non-major looks like versus uh, a regular music major? Well, one of the big things is that um, music majors have what's called a jury, and it's sort of like your final exam for lessons. And at the end of the semester, you perform for uh, the faculty, uh, depending on the area of your instrument. So a clarinet or saxophonist would perform for the woodwind faculty, uh, brass, uh, trumpet, so the brass faculty, and so forth. Um, that is not required of non-major lessons. So um, that's right out the window is your weekly lesson. Each uh, week you come in and work with your teacher and um, it's not as intense. Um, now, certainly if you want as a non-major to play a jury, I know in the Woodwind faculty, uh, we are all very supportive of doing that. 
And uh, so it's, it's kind of like up to you how serious you want to take it. But there's no requirement for that jury. It's, a, it's based on your weekly lesson grade, your participation, and your outside time. Yeah. Uh, I know this is a question that comes up every now and then. Um, I think, it, so let's say I've never played a musical instrument in my life, but I want to take lessons. Is the non-major lesson for me, or is there some other thing I should be thinking about? Well, I know, like, um, depending upon uh, your, your instrument, I know, like, for guitar, there is a group guitar class um, and things like that. For woodwinds, we don't necessarily offer that, uh, but we do have um, uh, many uh, graduate teaching assistants that have uh, a music degree already, and they're pursuing their master's degree, and they are available uh, to, to teach as well. Uh, that's right, yeah. So we have, that, that's right, so uh, Jim brought up that we have a, a group guitar class, um, so there's some stuff in there. I think it's not on the books, but I know that um, one of our members of our piano faculty has talked about creating sort of a, a class piano for for non-majors to, you know, beginners. But yeah, essentially, I think it's, this is just really important, so I wanted to put it out there, um, that if you've never played an instrument in your life, uh, the non-major lesson's probably not what you're looking for, but instead just hiring a private teacher. Um, and some of our some of our own faculty will do that, those lessons. We have lots of graduate students. Um, and there's also great music stores around um, the area who have actually a lot of our students are teaching at those music yeah. stores as well. <laughs> so if, you are, if you've never played a musical instrument, but you're interested, you know, certainly reach out to one of us. You know, if you go to our website, find the teacher of that instrument and say, I've never played an instrument, but I wanna learn. And that person can guide you to the appropriate kind of person. And most people don't charge a ton of money for, um, for those lessons, so, uh, so good to know. We do have a, a, a comment in the chat that just popped in and said the engineering school didn't accept music lessons for credit, but music history was okay. Uh, but that was back in 1981. Um, so it might be the same now, might not. I, I don't, I, I don't know. So I will say this. Thank you for that comment. Um, obviously, like you've got to talk to your school advisor, but if your school's advisor is telling you, oh, this won't count towards your, your, your degree, send them our way um, and we'll, we'll help with that. We've, we've been able to navigate a few of those things. Now, full disclosure, there are, are a couple of degrees that have no electives in them. And so, and engineering might be one of yeah, those. Yeah. Um, but if your degree has any electives, you can take music, uh, any music class. So, but yeah, thank you for that comment. And also to piggyback on what Dr. Sternfeld Dunn was saying about never playing an instrument, um, those auditions that we do at the beginning of the semester is to kind of assess that basically. I have in the bands had a couple of students that really wanna be in band and they, they enroll in the class and that's great. Unfortunately, remember, you're now trying to perform with students that have been playing instruments for six or seven years. So it's not that we don't want you involved, but I had to recommend maybe that they take lessons for a semester before they could get involved. It's, it's hard to do that. Um, you just won't understand. It's like trying to go into a, you know, a, a graduate level French class or something, you know, having never spoken the language, right? Uh, that's, that's the equivalent, you know, and so all of our students that are in the ensembles have been playing for a while. So if you've never played an instrument, talk to us first before you enroll in classes. I think that's important because we can help get you what you want. It just might be a little differently than you think. Um, and out of curiosity, sort of related to this, but different. Um, let's say I played uh, let's say I played clarinet through all of uh, middle school and high school, but and I always wanted to play in jazz band, for instance, but my teacher uh, didn't think clarinets belonged in jazz band, or as my teacher believed that bass players shouldn't take solos in jazz bands, uh, <laughs> which I mean, he's not wow. wrong. <laughs> uh, so, but let's say I want to play in jazz band, but but really I'm interested in playing saxophone in the jazz band. Is you know, so let, I've got a musical experience, or maybe I'm a trombone player who really secretly desired to be play euphonium. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I don't know Says why. Because but... they're like, what's a step down from trombone? I know. <laughs> <laughs> but is, it, it. <laughs> is that an opportunity where I might be able to, to play in an ensemble on a doubling instrument that maybe I haven't experienced before? So slightly different than I've never played an instrument before, but yeah. I'm interested in branching out to a like instrument. Um, is that something that I could do? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. In jazz ensembles, uh, you'd be surprised how easy uh, cl transitioning from clarinet to saxophone is. Um, we've had clarinet players, if there was the need in the trumpet section, they could play trumpet parts. Um, mm -hmm. We've even had French horn players play in the trombone section. Um, typically, you know, French horn is not a, a jazz instrument, um, or um, at least at least in collegiate and uh, uh, high school jazz ensembles. So yeah, there are definitely uh, um, points and in, in opportunities to do that. Um, we've had students come in who maybe their secondary was bass um, and they were a French horn player, speaking of I'm, so yeah. it's coming off the top of my head. And mm -hmm. you know, we had a place for them. So, uh, so just, you know, talk, especially if you have secondary uh, experience and also i know uh, dr shade there are, there are many um primary uh instrumentalists uh, but maybe they play a secondary instrument in symphonic band so maybe you could right. talk a little bit about that right yeah i mean that that's the thing we have students uh, that often will come in um that that are, are overachievers in another instrument and go well i would love to be a doubler eventually you know can i can i try and can i try and play oboe and typically it's the same thing. We'll do a brief assessment. And I'll usually let them come in and try and play in a couple of rehearsals just to make sure that they're able to, first of all, feel comfortable themselves because it can be daunting. Yeah. Um, and then make sure that, that they're not, um, and I don't mean to speak poorly, but they're not holding the ensemble back. Sometimes you can, you know, it's surprising. Saxophone section that happens a lot. Uh, a lot of saxophonists will double on tenor or very uh, or sneak over to clarinet. Um, so yeah, it's doubling happens all over the place for sure. And, and we, we actually, I know I recommend it. Professor Pisano is a doubler himself. So is Professor Hewlett. So we're all doublers here. Uh, um, even, even Dr. Sternfeld Dunn, bass player, <laughs> wannabe guitarist, wannabe. Oh, big wannabe. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so then, uh, we're almost out of time, but the last question I wanted to sort of bring up was, um, and I'll start with you, Lucas, because I think yours is sort of the most unique situation. So I'm a non-major, played whatever instrument, you know, all through high school, want to join the pet band, don't own an instrument, don't have one. Um, what kind of access can we provide to uh, students who can't provide their own instrument? Sure. So <clears throat> specifically to the marching band first, we do have a matched set of instruments that uh, we provide to all of our students. Uh, and that includes uh, all brass instruments, saxophones, and drums. We currently uh, don't necessarily have the means to provide flutes and clarinets, though I want to take this opportunity also to reach out and say that the marching band is accepting flutes and clarinets this year. It's, it's something, uh, <laughs> it's a hole we need to, to have filled. Uh, for everything else, uh, generally uh, our larger instruments become a first come first serve for majors. And then we work our way down. Um, and oftentimes if we aren't unable to provide an instrument that you can keep yourself, we are able to share instruments as well. Um, and so we've not had an issue in, we've had a couple, but we've not had a massive issue in providing instruments for everyone who is in need. So right. I take care of all those things as well. So you can reach out directly to me and ask me any of those questions and I'm happy to share what we have available for you. Uh, That's great. Uh, so Professor, Professor Hewlett is actually in charge of all of the instrument inventory. Uh, so one of the biggest stipulations that you're enrolled in a class, we've had several students come and say, hey, I really want to sort of dabble in playing clarinet. Can I just borrow or rent a clarinet? Usually you just got to be enrolled in a class. Um, and then most of us will send you to Professor Hewlett for instruments. Now I know, and Professor Pisano can talk to this, any of our upper level saxophones or upper level double reeds, alto flute, things like that, you still kind of go through the studio professor and then they'll send you to Professor Hewlett. Yeah. So in the bands, if you play bass clarinet, if you play Barry sax, if you play tuba, we do have some euphoniums, we have some French horns, uh, all of those bigger instruments we have available to you for you to use. Uh, the individual ones like flute and clarinet and trumpet, you probably need to have your own. We do have some, but they're just not gonna be very good quality because we have them for methods classes. So that's kind of the difference there. 
And I will say, and I think this has been mentioned in a different session before that um, if you if you don't have an instrument and for some reason we don't have a, one that we can lend you, that there are lots of music stores in town that will rent instruments, um, you know, Sensity Music Scene, uh, they're all out there and um, they're happy to do either rentals or rent to own even. Um, so, you know, uh, don't let an, an, a lack of a access to an instrument be the thing that stops you from participating. I will say this year could be a little different with renting instruments because of the pandemic. So we haven't, I'm not sure we've fully flushed all this out. So bear with us as we, you know, if you need to borrow an instrument, bear with us as we figure out how to keep you safe and us safe and yeah. the next person that uses the instrument safe. <laughs> that's that's so. a really great point. Yeah. Uh, We'll be dumping everything in acid is basically, I think. The... <laughs> there won't be any instruments left at that point. Yes. Well, I'm looking for a donor who will just buy us a whole new inventory of instruments every year. If you're that, you're that donor out there. <laughs> Please <laughs> contact one of us. <laughs> uh, 978-3500, we can talk. Um, all right. So I just want to quickly sort of summarize a couple of the big talking points. Um, every instrument has an ensemble that will uh, allows non-majors. So voice, we've got a bunch of choirs, orchestra, we've got an orchestra, winds, we've got concert band, jazz band, uh, marching band, pet band. So if you play or sing, we've got an ensemble for you. Guitar, we've got an ensemble for you. So we've got an ensemble for you. Uh, you do not have to uh, do the School of Music audition to be a non-major. That's really for majors only. Uh, unfortunately, if you are a non-major, we do not have music scholarships regularly available to you. Um, but you never know, sometimes we get a little gift that we are, we are able to give out. Oh, and uh, sorry, my percussionist too. There's a, someone threw in the comments from my staff. Yeah, percussionist too, we got a place for you. Uh, you don't have to do the formal audition. You just, uh, but, in the, the sort of the, the couple of days before the semester starts, there is a placement audition, not to not typically to root you out of an ensemble, but just to figure out which ensemble to put you in and where to put you. Mm -hmm. If you've never taken a, a lesson on your, in, if you don't play an instrument and you, you're looking to start, contact us and we can put you in touch with a great graduate student to take private lessons um, you'd have to pay for. If you do play an instrument and want to take lessons to even improve more, we have a special section of lessons for all instruments uh, at the non-major level. Um, is that, did I cover most of it? Is there anything I'm missing? If, you don't have to improvise to be in jazz, <laughs> uh, but if you want to, we've got a blues for you. Uh, <laughs> oh, and uh, maybe I mentioned like, for, we have like just a couple excerpts for the audition material itself. Yeah. So when you sign up, yeah, when you sign up to do your audition or when you, you go to do your audition on our website for each of those different areas, there's a, there's excerpts to play. Um, nothing too intimidating, right. but you just want to hear hear what you sound like, hear what you're capable of doing. Um, if you want to make music a hobby, non-major is the place for you. If you want a deeper dive, maybe a music minor, and if you want to make it your passionate career, that's when you'd want to be a music major. Quick, uh, quick side note for athletic bands, we're not having a formal audition for the fall this year. So there is a Google form up and we are collecting information. And so we're having sort of an open forum for the fall. So we will not be hosting any sort of audition until the springtime for our tournament travel band. There you go. So even less pressure there. Uh, if I'm in an ensemble, I should probably plan on practicing maybe 20, 40 minutes a week, you know, uh, unless I really want to, like, ex that's the minimum. You can always do more. Um, and if I'm taking lessons, I don't have to worry about a jury. So I think, I think that's, uh, oh, and it can count towards your degree if there's electives in your degree, no matter what your major. So yep. those, I think the big takeaways, anything else anyone wants to add at this time? Excellent. Well, I thank you all for joining me. 
Uh, Thursday, tune in to meet some of our students, talk about our music organizations that we have on campus um, and how you might get involved in that. Again, music organizations open to majors and non-majors. So, um, so there's a, we're a, we are a welcoming place to be. We want you here. So with that said, I will bid you all a good uh, day and we'll see you soon.